Hi to you all. I'm uh, trying out something new here now. This is a new playlist on my channel called uh, Lecture Series. Because you see, I'm uh, quite often traveling around holding talks and lectures about history and uh, other stuff. And uh, why not share this with you? So um, this first topic is on popular demand uh, called uh, the Rus Vikings. Yes, it's about all those Vikings who went eastwards instead of westwards. And uh, the depiction of the Viking Age and people think about Vikings, a lot of people think about those who went west and south. But if we go east and southeast, wow, that's another story. And it's a great story. And I'll bring you on that journey right now. I'll share my screen with you here so you can see and Maybe I'll close here. So as you can see here now, I've put up um, green is Scandinavia, of course, and um, the red here is Poland. And I didn't call them Rus Vikings in Poland. They still call them Northmen, just like in uh, present day France, they say in, uh, Normans. Um, but uh, actually Vikings were um, in a sense, uh, very important in the formation of the uh, of Poland. In addition, we have Belarus, which we call uh, White Russia in Scandinavia, and Ukraine and Russia. And I'll tell you the story right now, because there are many who will know by now that the Vikings were the founders of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. These early Vikings were called Rus Vikings, and they, were, they are known today as uh, with the names of Rurik, Igor Svatoslav, Vladimir the Great, and Yaroslav the, uh, the Wise, of course, and Olga of Kiev. Oh, and man, you should check out, um, I'm leaving you some, in the end here, some links. Uh, actually, I'll put them below also, and you can check out the different stories of these many great and important figures of uh, early Russian history. And Olga of Kiev, you should check out her, man. Her story is really, really impressive and interesting. But the thing is, these their names at the time, uh, Igor, that was Ingvar, right? And Svatoslav was Sveinald, Vladimir. Now, he was a fourth generation Rus. And uh, it could be after 100 years that um, we see in France also, in, in, in Normandy, among the Franks, that it took about 100 years, they intermarried with the local aristocracy, right? And, uh, and took more and more um, Russian names uh, and, and also spoke the local language as they went on. So, so uh, maybe, um, well, we called Vladimir the Great Valdemar Gamli in Scandinavia. And um, Yaroslav, his name was Yarislav. Uh, the thing is, these were all good Viking names, and Rus uh, became the common name for all Vikings from Scandinavia, which the name, name Russia stems from. And they ruled in lar a large dynasty of Rurik princes and principalities for a really long period of time. We shouldn't forget this. I mean, this is one dynasty from the 9th century to about 1600. And what happened then is quite interesting because there was actually a volcanic eruption in Peru, in South America, which caused a, a great tragedy and famine, um, causing a third of the population of Russia to, to die, actually. Um, and and this, actually, this was what made uh, the Romanos um, to be able to take over and, um, and take power in Russia. But the story in the Russian chronicles is well documented. And, uh, and even if early Russian historians argued against the Viking impact, and I see uh, some people also still do, uh, I'm for one, I believe in the Russian chronicles here. And, uh, and I am uh, I'm very happy to talk about Vikings in Russia because as I will show with DNA also, it turns out that Russian speaking peoples and, and those who consider themselves Slavic, have a lot of um, genetic heritage with Scandinavians. We have a lot of common um, grounds and, and are more like um, brothers and sisters and cousins 
So uh, we, it's so much easier to think ourselves like this in, in uh, the present time. And we have such greats as uh, important history, historical figures in, in Russian history, Alexander Nevsky, Peter the Great, Ivan the Good, Ivan the Terrible, and even Empress Catherine the Great, um, even though she was uh, after the um, Rurik dynasty, she embraced her um, Rurik heritage. And the thing is, the first Vikings were in fact asked to come over to help govern local Slavic populations who wished for more order in their cities, but also to control trade routes, which is all important. And I'd like to say here now, when uh, moving on, that you should know that there was a lot of trade here, not just in the Viking Age. I mean, this went really far back. I've been in Tbilisi on the great national museum there, and I've done research there in the Caucasus region. And uh, there's been so much trade for not even centuries, but thousands of years going back. They found amber, which you can go to the national museum in Tbilisi, and it's a great wine country, by the way. And you can see the beautiful ornaments that the um, nobility in the, in the of the cultures culture for example the greek colony in, in georgia and other cultures with wonderful animal ornaments but also they had amber from the baltic sea and they found proof of trade going as far back as 4200 years so this is nothing new and we know when people have traveled around the, these rivers they also there also was um, migration and mixing of peoples. So um, there's no wonder that, um, for instance, the Slavic uh, mythology and the Norse mythology are so similar. They do, yes, have common roots. I'll get back to that. Um, but also there's been a lot of communication and, and uh, meetings and in all sorts of ways uh, for many, many centuries before the Viking Age. But we're talking about the legacy of the Rus Vikings. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about DNA in, well, six, seven slides. I'll just show you here the this is, I just took this from Wikipedia, which is a pretty good source, I guess, to get a little oriented on the, on the, the, the why DNA and the haplogroups and stuff like uh, uh, a lot of people are interested in. And I1 is, uh, as you can see, particularly strong in Scandinavia. And I'll show you a little bit from a paper um, which have investigated the uh, Y haplogroups of Russian, uh, Russian speaking, that is, populations. And uh, yes, uh, that's going to be interesting to talk about. But first, this photo here, uh, sorry, this map that you saw before here, this is in the start once these principalities expanded, right? And here you can see in the 13th century when the Mongols and, and especially the Golden Horde came and took power over almost all the principalities except for Novgorod. And the story of how Moscow came to control everything is really, really interesting. And I'll show you that in just a second. But first, I've written down here, not primogeniture or primogeniture as I call it. And the way they expanded, you see, uh, primogeniture was what the Vikings presented in Normandy, in, in present day France. They, the Franks didn't have this. They would share the inheritance with all the sons, like Charles Mung, and he, especially his son did with his three grandsons. But the thing is, the Vikings, they had this one rule, um, which is still up to present day Norway. Even I have a friend who, who, who said he's the third brother. He didn't inherit anything. The thing is, the first brother inherits everything. And the other brothers, well, you have to make your own fortune. And this is quite special and it's very important among the Vikings. But for some reason, because there are two, three really different, well, important differences between the Vikings who went east and those who went west and south. And, uh, and one of them is that brothers inherited before sons. And this is very good for expansion, actually, it turns out. Uh, though there's a lot of competition and, and, and of course they, became, um, they had a lot of fierce battles among themselves, but it's not so good when 
some uh, foreign strong uh, warriors want to come in and use divide and um, and conquer in in the way which happened and and that's coming up really soon and i just want to show you this this is the rurik dynasty and it's only from 1157 it goes much further back in time but here you can see all the different uh, princes the rurik princes or the rus princes uh, who, who governed their own uh, principalities so let's move on i'll uh, do this real quickly because i this you can uh, read up on yourself i'm as i said i'm just telling you what i think is the coolest are the coolest things about the Rus vikings one thing is they went really far east um here you see the the rivers of um in in present russia and ukraine and these were all important for trade right and they went in bulgar here you for those who have seen the movie 13th warrior with antonio monteras they're depicting Ibn Fadlan, which was this Arabic uh, geographer, I guess, or writer uh, who, who wrote a great depiction of uh, the Vikings who came out there. But the thing is, you see here, it says the Khazar Khan, Khaganate. They controlled trade in this area, but only until the end of the 10th century. From then on, the Vikings took over and they controlled as far east as to Atil, which is on the border of present-day Kazakhstan even. That's how far east they went. And they controlled this area of the former Khazar uh, Khaganite for, for close to 300 years um, until, as we shall soon see, the Mongols and the Golden Horde came. So how far south did they go? Well, trade and toll taxes were all important to the Viking roads, uh, Viking Rus, I mean. And of course, the payment of tribute as taxation. And it was through controlling the many trade routes on the rivers on this map that they secured their power. And the thing is, uh, I got to tell you, by the way, uh, before we go how far south today, there's one thing you should know about Attil. When the, when the Vikings came there, the Rus Vikings, and they sacked the town, the trading town of Attil, it doesn't exist anymore, in the year 969, the following was written down. No grape or raisin remained, not a leaf on a branch. So that was um, quite a devastation uh, to take control of uh, the trading networks. And this also went down south towards Constantinople. And uh, there was actually, uh, I have this uh, painting here, it's really old. I think it's Greek, it looks like Greek letters. And... Um, it depicts um, Vikings attacking Constantinople, which they did uh, in present-day Istanbul. But after this, they had a standing army, which was the lifeguard uh, of the emperor of Constantinople. And uh, they, um, I got to tell you, I got to make, make a video about that because I got so much interesting stuff on these people. But to get a grasp on the sheer number of the Rus Vikings in the East, Think about this, the Imperial Guard in Constantinople were never less than 6,000 Varangians, as they were called. The Rus Vikings who went down there, but of course, many other Vikings went down there. The Varangian meant sworn companion, which eventually became the name of all Vikings from Norse areas coming to Constantinople up until the year 1066, when Anglo-Saxons started mixing in, actually. And um, even several Norwegian kings were in the Varangian Guard, which obviously was the place to be if you wanted to become skilled in warfare and rich at the same time. And these Varangians had many adventures, including helping the Normans ousting the Muslims from Sicily, and um, which there are several quite interesting depictions of in the old sagas. Um, and they also held the Varangians, I'll, I'll tell you that, a, an um, exceptionally high standard of ec ec ethics compared to at the time because according to Miss Byzantine sources once when a Varangian tried to rape a woman in Constantinople and she managed actually to kill him with his own sword his Varangian compatriots they showed up the next day at the woman's house to offer her the dead man's belongings as retribu retribution because this was not the proper way of a Varangian soldier and that's a pretty cool story but they did go really far south and they and and you got to keep in mind trade was really really important to this um just so you know that and 
as I said, there are many interesting um, personalities, historical figures here. I'd like to talk a little bit about Vladimir the Great because he was not only as I write here, the Prince of Novgorod and the Grand Prince of Kiev and the ruler of the Kievan Rus, but he was also responsible for choosing the Orthodox Christianity and not the Catholic Christianity, which we chose about the same time in 988, is that in Scandinavia. And imagine that, you know, making that choice, uh, if you look into the history, it's quite logical in a sense, but that's a separation between uh, Russia and the West for in, in so many ways, just like the Cyrillic script, which came about the same time because of the expansion, expansion of the church. And mind you, Vladimir the Great he is quite interesting because uh, when he was the great prince Vladimir in 980, that's eight years before accepting Christianity, he wanted to unify the various beliefs and, and um, in the Slavic religion to bind together everyone and, and um, make everything more centralized, I guess. Uh, I'll put up a photo here. This is after 988, um, a depiction of, of course. The thing is, he did this because of the deities that the Slavic mythology has uh, or had or has, depends on how you look at it. And, um, and they had uh, five deities, which he actually erected a temple on a hill or on several hills in the capital of Kiev. And, and the deities uh, were, among others, Perun, which uh, is the same as, um, as the Germanic and Norse god Thor, and also the Vedic Indra, by the way. He was the god of thunder, law, and war. And, uh, and some of the other gods, um, like um, uh, Shors and Dashbog and, and, and Stribog, they were actually um, had their roots in the Scythian and Samatian um, roots, uh, in a sense, but they turned up also in the, in the Iranian uh, mythology. So, so uh, there was a lot of similarities for the Vikings who came in as Rus Vikings, and, and there were a lot of them. And when they met with Slavic peoples and, and saw their um, ancient beliefs, the, this was very similar. And uh, the way Vladimir has been remembered uh, is very interesting. This is a, a note from uh, Ukraine in, in 2006, I think this came. And, and this is obviously a, uh, an important and vital person uh, to know about. And I recommend you uh, check out more about his history. And he's also a little bit uh, um, interesting, I guess, in the rise of Moscow. Because, and, and this is actually a photo, um, or an old photo, but it depicts the Kreml many, many centuries ago, uh, in the 15th century, I believe it was. Uh, so it's a depiction of how it might have looked, I guess. And, and the thing is, it's kind of weird. Uh, Moscow was a really small uh, city, not important at all. It belonged to the Grand Duchy of Vladimir in 1157 for uh, close to 200 years, but then everything changed. And the way the Moscovites took power, and these are the Rurik princes who settled in Moscow, right? Um, it's just a really amazing story. They were vassals of the Golden Horde for a long time, but the way they were vassals and the way the Golden Horde wanted to use divide and conquer, especially towards the Novgorods who they didn't conquer, uh, wow, that's an interesting story. I got to tell you. Uh, well, let me show you, because here you can see the Kievan Rus in the 11th century, and, and the different maps here shows some of the different uh, principalities, right? And down here in Rostov um, is, is present-day uh, Moscow about, and you can see here the territorial development between 1300 and 1547, this is the way they grew. And I'll get to that right now to see how they were able to expand. And Tver, which is in the middle between Novgorod and Moscow, was an important, powerful place. And Novgorod was even more important, but Moscow won through in the end. And much of this has got to do with a disaster, a horrible disaster. And we got to talk about that, man, because before the Golden Horde came into uh, Europe and uh, especially Russia and Ukraine uh, or present day, 
And before the Mongols arrived, they had this uh, one trip, <laughs> which was a crazy trip, in and they fought and fought and fought for several years. And this battle of the Kalka River, man, uh, I got to tell you, the Mongol invasions of the Golden Horde eventually meant that the Rus principalities were subjugated from the year 1237, in other words. But the Rus, they did get a, a taste of what fighting the Mongols was like uh, in this battle of Kalka River. Uh, and, and it's very interesting to know this because this is important to understand uh, something that happened later in history. I'll get to that now. The Rus princes, they gathered from the different principalities because this was an outside threat, right? And they decided to fight these Mongols on the steppes. And when the Mongols, in typical fashion, feigned retreat, meaning they pretended to run and maybe even be scared, right? Uh, the Rus princes, they followed them for nine days, Imagine that they followed them for nine days. And this is down here by, if you see Crimea down here and to the east, you have the Oslo Sea and you see the river going up here. That's the area where they followed them for nine days. And um, the thing is, they became almost annihilated. It was a great disaster. You know, I can, I can actually uh, think of one other disaster that these Viking descendants uh suffered in in normandy uh it's called the white ship i'll get to that in another video uh it's actually a drunken party that really really went wrong because they decided to take a ship which is called the white ship in year 1120 and it went down and with only one survivor out of 300 drunk people aboard and it caused a great civil war and actually in all practicality i guess the end of the normans in especially presently france and it was a great disaster and the same thing with this uh, Battle of Kalka River. I mean, so many important um, heirs and princes um, were um, killed in this battle. And um, um, there was an expensive lesson in this to be learned. Because the same tactic of feigning retreat and withdrawing for days on or weeks on can be said to have been used by Stalin in the defense of Moscow during Germany's Operation Barbarossa in 1941. And also earlier in 1812, I think, when Napoleon's army returned to France, and imagine he returned to France with only 20, 27,000 men, with an army that was originally 700,000 men a few months earlier, when attacking Moscow and even conquering Moscow. Um, the same tactic was used. And as you may know, Stalin was a very literate man and he cared very much about history. And I'm absolutely sure they knew very well about this battle of the Kalka River in 1223. And here you can see how this first expedition out from um, East uh, Asia, I guess, not even Central Asia came about. And, and how they returned. Um, and, and in this battle, oh, uh, just put up a photo here, you can see, um, there was only one uh, important prince who was called the Brave after this, who uh, um, escaped actually. And uh, that's something um, you can read about him also when you read about the river. But this was eventually what made uh, the real Mongol invention of uh, the older guy, the, the son of uh, Genghis Khan in 1236, and how they went fiercely in and conquered so much as you can see here in the photo. So let's get to the DNA. Is that okay now? I'm almost on the last slide. And um, my question is, so how much of Scandinavian DNA is there in Russia and Belarus and the Ukraine? And I'd like to first point out the linguistic side. As you can see here, this is just taken from Wikipedia, but it's, it's, it's fairly precise, I'd say. The approximate extent of all Norse and related languages in the early nine, uh, sorry, 10th century. And you can see here on the different places where the rivers were and where they had trade that were um, very important places. And, and check out the blue down here on Crimean Gothic. I've actually been there and done research and uh, that's coming in another video. Well, uh, I'm just gonna present a uh, indication as an answer to this. And I'm gonna use a rather old 2008 study where they gathered DNA and looked on on haplogroups. Uh, why DNA? 
uh, meaning men and their uh, sons and so on. And uh, I'll get to that uh, right now because um, what is interesting to get an indication of how much Scandinavian DNA, we can look at the I1A haplogroup. And this is a Y haplogroup. And I'll do a video also. I haven't done that yet, actually, on DNA. I should do that. Um, but uh, this is very prevalent in, uh, in Scandinavia, as you saw in the map uh, before. And here we can check out 12%, 11% where you have three and four, three is up here a little bit north and 11% there and six and eight down here in Livni. Um, this is very, very interesting. I mean, I mean this is a lot in, in specific areas here. And as they write in the paper, um, they say, of course, uh, as we all know, who are a little bit familiar with this, Scandinavia is enriched with I1A, that's the y Hapra group. And intriguingly, um, here you can read for yourself, but in the end here, um, it talks about what I just pointed out here. This spread pattern overlaps with ancient roots from Scandinavia to the Volga Basin. So that's a pretty strong indication that there are uh, a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, common heritage and and uh, mutual DNA we can say I guess between Scandinavians and Russian speaking peoples in uh, in uh, Russia Belarus and the Ukraine. So um, this is basically what I wanted to show you because this is what I think is cool about the Rus Viking. But there's a about the Rus Vikings, but there's a lot more. So if you want to talk about more, we can do that below in the comments field. And also, if you have some more interesting topics that you'd like to um, talk about in this um, lecture series, we can do that. I just like, I would like to finish off by saying um, there are many heroes of old Russia, still held dear by many who were in fact of Viking descent because of this Rurik dynasty. I talked about Alexander Nevsky, um, but the legacy of these Rus Vikings, choosing both the East Orthodox Church instead of the Catholic one and the Cyrillic alphabet or script as the Russian norm. I mean, these early paths chosen by these Viking descendants and their, well, it would seal the future of many Russians and, and their like forever after. And not to forget, mind you, even the terrible resettling of the Novgorod noble families. I told you Novgorod was a stronghold, right? So they did this first deportations that we've seen so much of in the, in the past 100 years. And uh, they did this resettling of the Novgorod noble families all around um, Russia at the time. And further deportation of opponents of Moscow in the following centuries also sealed, in my opinion, spreading of Viking bloodlines to all Russians alike, or in genetics in a sense. So in summary, one could say shed, shedding this new light on our common Viking heritage should tell us all that we are more closely related than previously thought. And that's a good thing, right? And that's something to think about whenever a toast or a Viking skull is to be proposed among Russians in a good manner. Here are some uh, photo sources and for more reading, I'll put it downstairs so you can uh, you can you can you can check that out if you want, and I hope you really um, enjoyed what I think is cool about the Rus Vikings in this lecture series. Now, please, if you want to um, continue with this and see more of these in the lecture series, let me know, and um, I for sure would like to do something on the uh, Viking descendants who went down to Sicily and southern Italy because that's another incredible story. And it's, it's even connected to the Sicilian mafia. At least that's what I can state as a hypothesis, as a historian. So we'll get to that. And uh, I'm wishing you a good, really good uh, weekend. Here it's uh, lockdown all over Norway now and no stores are open. It's really, really crazy. Yeah, so that's 21. 2021 for you. It's turning out to be just like 2020 or maybe even worse. I don't know. You tell me. Take care and uh, I'm wishing you a great, great weekend. Thanks.